Hello, 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 people. Welcome back to the MUFC MPB channel. It's another Tuesday, which means, thankfully anyway, I'm joined by another brilliant guest. This individual doesn't need too much of an introduction. If you follow him on Twitter, you know he's right across Manchester United. For all of his sins, I believe he's a Manchester United fan as well, so we'll have to dissect a little bit into that as well. I'm, of course, joined by the brilliant Sam Pilger. He's a football journalist, Manchester United fan, as I said, author. He's featured in The Athletic, 442 Forbes, you name it. This individual has been across it. Sam, thank you you so much for joining me and I always like to ask my guests before we get into it what's it like covering Manchester United well <laughs> it's been good fun it's been good fun yeah I mean I was very lucky my first ever job was uh on the Manchester United magazine the, the club's official magazine um back in 1996 when there, there were better times to follow the club <laughs> but um yeah look I mean it, it, it's 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 an incredible club and I love for all the ups and downs I've seen so much success my son is 18 and my daughter is 15. I hope they get to see the success I I have seen. But um, it's incredible. And I do. it does make me smile when I, pe I think, you know, people on Twitter sort of say, oh, well, no one mentions this about this club. And no one, United are treated differently. They're the biggest club. They are the biggest club. Get 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 over it. Get on with it. This, <laughs> this is it. I've, I've dealt with it and learned to live with it. So we are treated to a different standard because uh, I'm talking about we now, but yeah, as a fan, we we are United are the biggest club. So uh, just have to deal with that. Yeah, for sure. I think if there's anyone that can refer to Manchester United as we, it's a long-standing member of the supporting <laughs> society like yourself. So I think, look, there's so much to get through and I know you're strapped for time, so we'll try and rattle through as much as we can. I think, look, the, the one big name that's really been linked with Manchester United, if you consider everything and all of the aspects, is Dan Ashworth. You know, this has been a an ever-going saga, which unfortunately doesn't seem to be ending in the next day or two, which I think all of us would like from a not only a Manchester United perspective, but also from a journalistic point of view. To put this one to bed and to get it officially confirmed would be great. But how likely is Dan Ashworth to be starting in the summer, for example? And if it isn't going to be the summer... When do you think or what have you heard in terms of when he will officially begin his his new era at Manchester United? I, I think I think he will be there for the summer. I mean, there are no guarantees. I mean, it was an open secret within football for, for months, long before it was United made their approach and long before it was leaked. I, I certainly heard it was an open, open secret. He was United's uh, main priority. Newcastle knew the approach would come in. They were ready for it. And, you know, football clubs, if they're smart, they plan ahead. Newcastle would have would have known it was coming, would have been aware Ashworth was interested in it. I mean, although he was committed to the Newcastle project in it, you know, that is an upgrade going to Manchester United, especially with the Ineos involved. Um, he did have, Ashworth did have the chance to go to United, I think a year or two, 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 three years ago, but it would working with John Murtagh and he, he was, wouldn't have been the main man. He wouldn't have had full control. He didn't like that. He likes to have full control so he turned it down now he's got what he wanted i i think i think as well the thing is newcastle have started looking for new sporting directors they want to move on they don't want this guy on the payroll on gardening leave it's not a good look as well for newcastle i look at they they they've got their pride they don't want to be rolled over but it's not a good look for newcastle to for their employees to think well if you do get a better offer and there are better offers in newcastle we're going to punish you and we're going to do this so i think Newcastle are looking right for a replacement already. Maybe it will hinge on that, but I, I think there's a, a very good chance it will be uh, he'll be in situ for United for the summer. Yeah, I think uh, as as I said just a minute ago, you know, it's a situation where. Almost everything is up in the air at the moment, isn't it? I think Man United fans want clarity. Um, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, of course, <laughs> wants a little bit of that. But as we know, following Manchester United, that club and clarity don't tend to go in the same sentence. But I think, look, one big thing and one thing that has been made very clear is under the new structure of Ineos and Sir Jim Ratcliffe, that everyone is under review, if you like. You know, no one is 100% safe, whether that's the players, the coaching staff, or even above the coaching staff in terms of the board level. But in terms of Eric Ten Hag, now, of course, you know, the, the 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 quotation, shall we call it, that's going around on the paper talk and all of that kind of stuff is that he has this stay of execution, if he likes, you know, the, uh, the what, what, what do they say normally, you know, uh, pay as you play or something like that. You know, that's the type of vibe that he's getting at the moment. You know, he's got the next couple of months to really put his case forward as to why he should be the man in charge of Manchester United's football team. But of course, as we know, you know, contingency plans are, are drawn up in, in, in sort of, you know, working environments anyway. There have, of course, been several names already being linked with the new Manchester United job. 
But what can you tell us about Eric Ten Hag? It is my understanding that he will get until the end of the season. But from then, with the summer coming in, with Ineos coming in, is he likely to say, or will Man United have a new man at the helm? Oh, I think it's it's such, so difficult to tell. I mean, you imagine if Anthony's shot had had ricocheted off the post and and gone and, and gone behind for a goal kick. You know, it's such narrow margins. You know, uh, people forget how badly United played in that second half. <laughs> you know, they were lost two one. And this would have been a, a wretched two weeks for, for for Ten Hag with with um, speculation about his position. As he as he won, they have a, a stay of execution. I don't know. I mean, I've heard it said that the decision has has been made, um, but this was in the like the Fulham loss, the the City loss. That that you know he was um, that he wouldn't be the United manager. That they were looking for for uh, replacements. Obviously, Ineos are looking, they are thinking about um, potential replacements because this season could still end badly. It's really fluid. It is really week to week. So I, I don't, the, the simple answer is I don't know because I don't think the decision has been made. There are people that think it has been made and that is to replace him. I don't think that's the case because how could it be if 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 the season finishes on a surge, finish in fourth place, possibly fifth place is Champions League, with you know, win the FA Cup, which which with you know with the draw with with Coventry, um, it, it it's uh, but you never know with this season. You know, a lot of people are thinking, oh, the FA Cup final, brilliant. But you know, United, the course of United season where they struggle to beat Newport, you can't take anything for granted. So I think it 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 really is week to week, except for this week where there's a break, so it's two weeks, and and you know. Um, we will see Liverpool are back in a couple of weeks, obviously at Old Trafford. Um, there was a feeling that he couldn't survive if United lost in the Cup and mm -hmm. in the league to Liverpool. Almost like uh, David Moyes 10 years ago that, that consigned him was, was losing to City 3-0 and Liverpool 3-0 within a couple of weeks at home, both at Old Trafford. So he's, he, he, it has been a bit of a stay of execution. The difficulty is, well, the men who will make the decision aren't in the building. Barada and Ashworth, they're not in the building. They're literally, Barada's not in the building and, and Ashworth hasn't even been, is still a Newcastle employee. So it is very fluid and I think it, it, will, be, it will be dependent on results. But I would also say, I would also say if... If you're long-term planning, that's pretty a naive approach to take that United get a dramatic 4-3 win, one of the greatest fan experiences in years, to then go, well, the, yeah, Ten Hag is the man for the job, forgetting the disaster of this season. So I think they will take a long-term approach. Something we might come on to, I think really influencing this, really influencing this, is a lack of a notable replacement. The successes, the list is so poor the 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 this this might encourage them we want the first year eric ten hag if there's any chance you know any of us think if we could get the ten hag of his first season we don't want to take the risk of bringing in a replacement rather than the ten hag we've seen mostly for this season so um yeah i think the lack of replacement uh, successor is a, is a big deal yeah, for sure. It's interesting that you say that, you know, in terms of obviously Manchester United looking at potential replacements for Eric Ten Hag, I'll be, I'll be open and honest and I'll say that, you know, there were certain games this season where I felt like Eric Ten Hag isn't the right fit for Manchester United. I think he's a brilliant manager, but I think, you know, the way that things have panned out and, and the one that really, strangely enough anyway, really hit home for me was when United beat Sheffield away 2-1. And initially people are going to go, well, may not have won the game. What's the issue? But it was the lack of entertainment. It was the lack of understanding from the players' perspective that really concerned me. But as you've just said there, you know, even though I was someone who was open to Eric Ten Hag leaving, that then reverts you to the situation of who would the potential replacement be? And as you've alluded to, the, the list of names, they're not exactly cutting edge. They're not some certain individuals that are really moving me as a Manchester United supporter. So if it was a situation where it would be either Eric Ten Hag for one more year or the likes of someone like a Gareth Southgate, for instance, for me personally, I think that's a no-brainer. Um, you know, yeah. would I want someone who's been at Man United for two seasons or do I want someone who hasn't managed in club football for, I think, about 14 years? So, you know, again, as you say, it's going to be really interesting to see the types of replacement or competition, if you like. And competition's a brilliant word, isn't it? Because ultimately... That's what we want to see from the team perspective. That's what we want to see amongst the squad. We want to see new players coming in. 
And that's what I really wanted to ask you about. This is a big question, of course, for Manchester United supporters because signings are what get us most excited. We can talk about a director of football. We can talk about a new CEO, but we want to see a new star striker or, or a great centre half, you know? So in terms of the players coming into Manchester United, what type of profile do you think Man United will now be sort of targeting before we get into specific names? I think... I think I think names are difficult because I think that as we said, like Ashworth isn't there, Barada's not there. Um, obviously, the club can't start looking as soon as they arrive. This this is, is is happening, but I don't think I think you know money will be spent. But I think Jim Ratcliffe gave you a, 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 um, a window into his thinking where he said you know he wanted to buy the next Mbappe, the next Jude Bellingham, and United tried to obviously buy the Jude Bellingham <laughs> and that, that didn't quite work out. But I mean, obviously that's not an innovative, amazing approach. All clubs, clubs want to do that. They want to pay, pay, you know, get a, pay 10 million pounds for a player rather than a hundred million pounds. I think the incredible thing is, I think if Kobe Manu was on the open market, he would be a hundred million pound player. If you look at what Casido and uh, Fernandez have gone for recently. So United have saved money there. Um, I think in terms of in terms of um I think centre back there'll be a lot of movement there. That is really fluid. Um I think there was, I mean, a year ago there was, there was even though Wan Basaka and Dallo were providing good competition, I think there was talk of another right back. That's that's now on the back burner. I think obviously there is Dallo, who's arguably United's best player this season. Wan Basaka is always reliable and came in and did a great job at left back. But I think that with Luke Shaw's injuries, with Malassia not having not played this season, I think there's interest in left back, a centre back, a, a, a defensive midfielder, um, because I think there's some. Kobe Menu is still developing, but I think he, he he's almost got. He was seen as a, uh, a defensive midfielder when he made his debut, but he's obviously a very attacking player, and we've seen that. So he's still developing. I think he could be more of a playmaker and, and get forward. Uh, somebody said they thought, you know, he's like Iniesta, uh, which, Not which, bad. Is, Not which, bad. which is high praise, isn't it? But, <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly, I've, I've watched United for over 40 years and as a fan and, and writer. And that boy is, is incredible. He is absolutely incredible. What, what, what a talent and how lucky United are to have him. I said, so, so, so um, saving money in, in the process. So I think United will be, I mean, if you look at the decline of, decline of Casemiro, I do think a number six, a defensive midfielder to allow Manu that freedom and to develop because um, I think the decline of Casemiro is not being reversed. Um, and then and then, a, and then a striker. Um, and again, things are so fluid because if you think of last summer, the idea in United's ideal scenario was that to buy Harry Kane and that Rasmus Hoyland would be his apprentice. He would be the cheap option. And, you know, they go all out for Kane, but Hoyland was too good. They didn't want to let him pass, but he could be the backup, maybe get some Carabao Cup games or a couple of league games. And yet, obviously, you know, I think initially they were hoping 25, 30 million, and it was 72 million, and he's now the main man. So it, it changes really quickly. But obviously, with Martial almost certainly leaving, um, United are so light on strikers, number nines, that, that they they will look to buy somebody. But I think you can't limit Hoyland's uh, growth and, and and game time. So it would be somebody that that would um, that could uh, complement him um, and wouldn't be sort of the main man that would expect to play all the time. Yeah, for for sure. Uh, one thing I did want to uh, ask you about in terms of obviously before we get into specific names of incomings and outgoings mm. is. The budget for Manchester United going into the summer, you know, what would it look like, let's say, in a very unlikely situation, as we know, Man United will be making some sales. But if they were to have very limited sales, for example, what kind of budget would Man United fans be expecting to work with in terms of any incomings in the summer? I mean, I mean, I couldn't give you an exact figure. I think FFP will, will play a role in that as well. But I think there will be... Look, this is Ineos's first summer. Well, they, they weren't officially... Yeah, so they had January. They didn't really have mm. January. Yeah, the confirmation came after. This is their first big summer with their, all their men in place. There will be significant 
um, comings in and goings. Um, and, you know, I think I think a good amount of money will be spent. But as you alluded to and was and was the plan for last summer was that with FFP and with how it's set up as well, that you ne- you're going to m- need to make sales. The more sales you make, the more signings you can make. I think the two people that were earmarked to be sold last summer, obviously, was Scott McTominay and Harry Maguire. Now, United thought they could raise 50, 60 million pounds in the transfer market, a significant amount. Both those transfers nearly happened. They didn't. And they've both had interesting seasons where you think, well, hang on, these were our saleable players. But, you know, um, they, uh, they've they had good seasons. Do we hold on to them? Mason Greenwood, obviously, I, I think it's almost certainly Jim Ratcliffe sort of muddied the waters there, didn't he, when he came in, which was strange because although when he when they made their announcement, if you looked at it, they didn't ever say Greenwood would never play for Manchester United again. It was like, right, he, he's not going to. He's he's done well in Spain. But I, I think they don't want to to to, to re-legislate that or re-litigate that rather. So um and you know Greenwood is young, as impressed in Spain. That that will raise a lot of money too. So again, it, it it's difficult because w- what they would would spend would uh, depend on their sales. Um, there will be a lot of a lot of movement. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and one big name that has been linked with a move into Manchester United is of course Jared Blanthwaite. You know he's on currently one of the finest players in the in the country really if we're talking about form and talking about potential and ceiling however you want to sort of shape it up this guy is in a very exciting individual and he will ultimately and inevitably attract a lot of attention not just from Manchester United but other big clubs in the country as well so I know you've obviously done a bit of work around this I know you've covered this story in terms of Branthwaite is he genuinely a top target for Manchester United and in terms of the price tag of course obviously dependent on Everton's future Will that potentially be a stumbling block as well? What 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 is the latest on Branthwaite? I think I mean there's there is an interest. I mean United obviously have a a, a short list of players for every position, and, and wouldn't surprise that the that, that top players are on there, including himself. I as I understand it, there was there's been a little bit of uh, a, a contact um, as there are in these situations, but I think a lot will depend on Everton's future, as you alluded to. I mean Everton get relegated. It's a fire sale. His price goes down. Everton stay up. I've saw. I you know was it a month or two ago? To talk of seventy five million. That's you know. I, I think that will put put off United really. If you think that Martinez came in and the impact he made at thirty five forty million, I can't remember exactly. Um, so there is interest. I also think you know he's young. He's inexperienced. I think they might want a bit more. Um, uh, experience to bring in there, especially if you look at Evans possibly leaving Maguire, Varane, that would leave a very young um, presence at the at central defence. So, um, yes, th- there is interest. I'm I'm not sure. It, it, it could happen. It could happen. But I think they would be possibly interested in, in cheaper, cheaper uh, alternatives. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think, obviously, of course, you know, the, the sales of, of the potential players at Manchester United are a really big aspect. And you alluded to him a, a little bit earlier on in terms of Casemiro. You know, he's a player who, in his first season, was absolutely incredible. He was integral to Manchester United's success, not only in the defensive work and breaking up play, but also popping up with the odd important goal, you know, in the in the League Cup final he scored. And he was a player anywhere that Man United were looking at and thinking, wow, how on earth have Real Madrid let him go? But very seldom do Real Madrid let players go when they know they've still got a few years left. So I think we should have had a bit more of an indication when it comes to that. But obviously this season it hasn't worked out. There's obviously a, a bit of fear, if you like, from Man United fans that he's sort of on the wane, he's at the twilight of his career and he's not quite performing at the levels that we've known him to perform at throughout his career. So do you think it is it is almost expected for him to depart this summer with, of course, the likes of Saudi Arabia interested in Casemiro? I think, yeah, I think it's highly le- highly likely Casemiro uh, will will depart. I think for, for, for two reasons, to get his wages off the off the books, which, which, which are enormous but also just because he, he he has declined so much which has been which has been incredible to see and I think as well Jim Ratcliffe has actually said publicly beforehand before he was I think even before he was bought United that spending so much money on a 30 year old who soon turned 31 you know 60 rising to 70 million didn't make any sense I think we'll all look back and enjoy Casemiro's first season, which was which was incredible, a real master at, at work. I mean, and and um, 
that you know and obviously led to united winning the carabao cup he scored in the final um you know it really did a fantastic repair job the hope was i mean there was fear you know united in that summer of 2022 having missed out on de jong having tracked him for so long were so desperate to get a great midfielder in place there was a there was a nagging doubt to go he's 30 he's about to turn 31 um but but and unfortunately those fears have come true because if you look at tony cruz Luka Modric, the hope was, you know, these they're, they're fantastic at 35, 36, 37. You're thinking, can Casemiro do that? Well, the short answer is no, because he it was quite incredible how much he'd fallen off at the start of the season. Then he was out for that injury. And I thought, well, you know, injury, rest. Yeah. And and he's come back and he's been, he's he's he, he hasn't been great. There's been a few goals. Obviously, the winner at Forest, you know, he's still a good player. But I think as well, I think, you can see that 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 Ten Hag has substituted him at half time, brought him off. He's picking up yellow cards, so he's been substituted because it's too much of a risk of him getting sent off again. I don't think he'll like that. I think as well, I don't know this, but my guess is that he will look to himself and go, he's not being humiliated, but I'm the great Casemiro. I was fantastic last year. I've had this career, career Real Madrid and Brazil. This isn't, you know where he's being outshone by an 18 year old kid he's being substituted i think he might think you know i had a good first year or two years at united has been a nice experience but yeah go for the easy money at saudi arabia or some somewhere else but i think united will want to freshen up the midfield will want to release the wages i think it's highly likely yeah he will uh he will be sold yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm inclined to agree with that one because at the end of the day, as you said, you know this this movement now in the, a different direction of the profile and the the fee that Man United now will want to pay for for players, Casemiro doesn't fit that bill. I just got about yeah about two more questions, and I just want to get your thoughts on on, on something as well, more of an opinion uh, question sure. to finish everything <laughs> up. Uh, one really really interesting name that that is being banded around at the moment and has been as you've alluded to a little bit earlier on is Scott McTominay. Now, the reason why I find this one so interesting is because, look, as you've said already, that last summer, I think most Manchester United fans would have been very open for him to leave. It was a 100% profit, if you like, because, of course, he was an academy product and it was almost like he was surplus to requirements and the old, you know, McFred midfield partnership has been disbanded and, you know, Man United will move on to, to new and, and bigger and better things, if you like. But if we actually look at Ineos's sort of, you know, ideal signing it would be someone who's under the age of 26 27 it would be you know someone who really understands Manchester United has a British core understands the values of the club in within the country and also someone who doesn't really kick up too much of a fuss you know Scott McTominay has been on the fringes but as we've seen many a time just this season alone he steps up and he provides very important moments for Man United and it's crazy to say an individual who was on the verge of leaving Man United could be a massive factor as to why Eric Ten Hag's actually still in the job at the moment. So with Scott McTominay, yeah. considering, you know, that Ineos, in terms of that profile of player, he would fit the mould. But then on the other hand, if they want to raise funds, and it would, as I say, be 100% profit with financial fair play in the background. What what do you think and, and, and what do you see Scott McTominay's future looking like beyond the summer? It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think, yeah, Ten Hag was open to selling him last year, obviously. That, that, that much was clear. Um, but I, th I think not long ago, if you take away uh, McTominay's goals, I think United at, some, at one point recently would have been 12th. And, and that's it. That's incredible. He is a strange, strange player because he is a he's a midfielder. But technically, he can't keep the ball. You know, obviously, Ten Hag wants to play possession football, a high line, high pressing. He can't he, he simply can't do that. The amount of passes he has. Um, technically, I mean, he had, you know, with McFred, he was never a defensive midfielder. Um, remember those couple of goals he got get, got against Leeds years ago? He's sort of been unleashed this season and it, it has been fantastic to watch. Um, obviously scored against Liverpool, could have scored the winner as well. Mm. Um, forget about that. It was such a dramatic game. <laughs> his, 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 his arrival in the box is in, incredible. It reminds me of... My one of my childhood is uh, Brian Robson, like his late arrival in the box, getting on on stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. So it, it's a strange, strange player where you're getting these goals, but outside the goals, and obviously goals change games. What are you getting? Because he just he, 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 his passing games just not there. The amount of passes sometimes he makes in a half is 
is incredible. So, I mean, if it's a new manager, I think Ten Hag might be might be uh, minded to 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 keep him. But I think it's interesting for McTominay as well because he he, he what does he want? What does he want? Does he want to be? I don't think Manchester United win a league title with Scott McTominay in its start in in their starting eleven. I just I I just don't see that. Which seems cruel after this season what he's contributed, but I just I don't see that. So maybe it's a question for McTominay of would he want to go to West Ham and you know fight for sixth or seventh each year? You know, playing front of London Stadium, sixty thousand. West Ham are, are a great club with a, a big fan base now, but but or does he want to season after season continue fighting? And but almost like what more can he do? He couldn't have been a bigger match winner. He's not going to change his game. He's not going to become this technically brilliant midfielder. Um, what more could he do? And if he's still not getting a starting place, maybe he might look to move on. But Manchester United is a difficult place to leave. So it's an interesting one, really. I'm not sure. There has been a bit of talk about a new contract, you know, and, and not wanting to lose these players, these characters from the dressing room that give so much and have fought. And as you say, have possibly saved uh, Ten Hag's job. Uh, you think back to those two late goals against Brentford. So um, yeah, that would be an interesting one to see. But I, I, I think I, I don't see Scott McTenner ever being an automatic first choice for for United team no, that yeah. wants. To yeah, leave. for sure. Totally agree. Totally agree. And you talk about characters, and you talk about the importance, of course, of of having big leaders in the dressing room. And one very big character in the world of football at the moment is a certain Ivan Tony. Now, of course, mm. Ivan Tony has been linked with several clubs. You know, uh, someone said on Talksport, I think it was Rory Jennings a couple of days ago, that Ivan Tony has all of a sudden become the savior for everyone. You know, if Brentford <laughs> sell him, then then they'll get relegated. If Arsenal buy him, they'll win everything. You know, Chelsea need a striker; they'll get into European spots if they. They sign him and why don't we just throw Man United in there for good measure as well? <laughs> and I think, look, Ivan Tony, we know he's going to attract a lot of attention. He he understands how good he is. He's got this this positive arrogance, if you like, to his game, which I think is is very welcomed and uh, sort of alluring, isn't it? That the, the fact that he does believe in his ability so much and it feels like he's ready now to make that big move. But in terms of Man United, in terms of a potential price tag for Ivan Tony. Do you think that this could be something that would would almost come into fruition, or do you think this would be again in the category of a bit of paper talk? Um, I, I would be surprised. I mean, obviously, I think it would be a good idea for United, but if you think he's got a year left on his contract, his contract expires in twenty twenty five, you would think that would make him cheaper. But if you look at the case of Mason Mount last year, you know Chelsea had held out for fifty five rising to 60 million for a player who has barely played this season, obviously, but they went to know that and then had a year left on his contract. Having a year left on your contract should make you cheaper. <laughs> but, you know, if you're looking at guaranteed Premier League goals, I mean, if, 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 if Brentford wanted to ask for 80, 90 million, it sounds ridiculous, but it's, it's not. And they're his importance to them as well. So I think it'd be, I, I, and also Tony is the age is, well, I think 26, 27, he'd want to go somewhere and be the main, man as well. United have got Hoyland. Um, I think United would be looking for a more I know it sounds ridiculous because Hoyland is an up and coming striker. I think they would be looking for a more up and coming striker that could work with Hoyland and share game time. I think somebody like Tony, you spend 70, 80 million. He has to play every week. I, I mean, from what I have heard, I think he's more minded to stay in London anyway. Um, obviously, Brentford at the moment, but stay in you know South West London with, 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 or move there with Chelsea or Arsenal. Is he an Arsenal fan? That sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, he's he's flirted with the idea to say that yeah, he's going to Arsenal, Arsenal fan, hasn't he? Yeah. Chelsea. I I think I think I had heard he's more minded to 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 remain in London anyway. So um, yeah, I think it'd be a, it would be a, it would be a great signing for United, but I I think unlikely. Yeah, I, I I completely agree. It's a it's a very attractive storyline for us journalists and and, and broadcasters <laughs> and content creators, but I don't think that one's really going to come into uh, into play. Sam, thank you so much for joining me. I've just got one final final yeah, sure. question. This isn't you know any inside information that I'm trying to rack your brains <laughs> out or trying to look for the title of the YouTube video today. This is just completely your opinion and your thoughts. You know, as you've said right at the top of of, of the podcast today, you know you've covered and followed Manchester United for decades. You know you've seen the highs, you've seen some incredible lows of, of more recent times. 
But with this new era of Manchester United now, you know, Ineos coming in, said Jim Ratcliffe with Omar Barada and everyone else coming into Manchester United, with all of your understanding and experience being around the football club, how do you think this plans out? Or pans out, shall I say? And 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 what do you what do you believe as more so? I'm going to say a Manchester United supporter more than anything. How yeah. do you see this unfolding under, under Ineos? And do you think they can can bring back the glory days of yesteryear? I think I think the the, the first signs are hugely uh, encouraging. Hugely encouraging. I mean, if you look under the Glazers, obviously Sir Alex Ferguson provi- provided a, a fig leaf after he's left United. Obviously, haven't won the league, some cups. But have have never never even challenged for the title. You know, finished second twice, but weren't in title races. Under the Glazers, it would have been more drift. Um, they're not football people. They don't, they're, they're not interested in football. They barely come to the games. It's it's a money making operation for them, as it always has been. So that's not to say they haven't provided managers with money. They certainly have. Mm-hmm. They paid eighty five million for for Anthony not long ago. But the the, the real. They they were they were happy just to tick along. There was no great impetus there. So the fact that they've been sidelined, although they still own seventy three percent of the club, and Ineos, you just have to look. It's not talk; it's action. So Omar Barada, that came out of nowhere. He was being lined up for a similar position at Manchester City. Um, the fact that United still has that draw that they can take people out of City. His experience and all he's done in the last ten years with with City success. Um, you know, this phrase that gets banded around best in class, which we really, you know, what United used to be about, to have the best players in each position and the best manager for so long. And then obviously with Dan Ashworth as well, you know, with, with what he's achieved with England and then Brighton and early with Newcastle, his contacts. I think that's hugely encouraging. So I think as well, Jim Radcliffe, I think, I don't know about you or, or people who watches. I was or I was always deeply reluctant to get in bed with with Qatar and nation state with with all the the human rights record and 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 just to be owned as a plaything as as a state that didn't appeal to me at all. And I thought Ratcliffe not perfect, far from perfect, but a Manchester United fan, a Manchester lad who's made good, very good. <laughs> I, I think that was, was more appealing of the, the, the choice United had. And I think he hasn't put a, a foot wrong, really. I think the interviews he's given, the way he's opened up to the, the press, he's engaged, he's spoken. You know, the podcast with a cycling podcast not a couple of weeks ago, that was encouraging um, what he said, how he sees things. And I think I think United, for once, are, are going in the right direction. Um but the interesting thing is, is, is the manager, as this was said, as we alluded for before, you know, if you're talking to the best in class, Barada, Ashworth, is Ten Hag this summer the best in class, the best manager United could have? And that is really, really, really difficult question to answer. Um, so I think there was, I thought, you know, you think of all, everything is new, new sport director, new CEO, there's other new positions. They want to fill as well. So you just thought inevitably the momentum is moving to a new manager. It has to be. It has to be a new manager. They want to start with a pre- their man, a fresh new manager. But the Liverpool win uh, has stopped people in their tracks and it goes week to week. And as we said before, the, the replacements, you know, people laugh Gareth Southgate. It's a credible link because, because obviously Dan Ashworth, work with him at the FA, that it seems to make sense, you know, two plus two and, and, and people are putting it together. I would be very surprised if I can't see Southgate. I can't see Southgate, this grand new project. And here's a manager with no track record in the Premier League. Well, an average one at, at Middlesbrough years ago. So, um, yeah, it, I think it's very encouraging. I am as a as United writer, but as a United fan who goes to games as a fan, uh, with my with my with my kids, as I said earlier, eighteen or fifteen, I want them to see success. But yeah, I don't know. Has I mean, I've you know, I've been lucky enough to see a lot of United managers. One for most of the time, a lot of them had charisma. And this worries me slightly. The only thing that worries me, Ten Hag, does he have that charisma? Does he have that presence? Um, you know, so we will see. But yeah, it goes week to week. But as I said, if Anthony's shot had hit the post, we would be having a different discussion. Football is it can be a strange business, so so let's see. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's um, it's a game of fine margins to say the least, isn't it? But brilliant, brilliant stuff today, Sam. Thank you so much, not only for, of course, you know, joining me today on the MUFC MPB channel, but being a right across, you know, pretty much everything there is to do with Manchester United. I think there's a there's a world now and an era where people want to just sort of say the big controversial things and and really get their name out there for clicks and numbers and revenue and all of that stuff. But I can confirm and I can firmly say that you are not in that camp, which is an absolute brilliant not, thing to some, see. I don't sometimes I don't tweet for days, weeks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. But that, <laughs> that's that, more. My matter has always been less is more. <laughs> exactly that, exactly that. But no, look, Sam, thank you so much for joining me. My Keep pleasure. up the brilliant work. And I really hope the next time we do have a conversation, it's going to be about where we're going to meet for Man United's Premier League trophy parade. So um, <laughs> let's hope so anyway. So Sam, thank you so much once again. My pleasure. And thank you, of course, to everyone who has watched today's episode on the MUFC MPB channel. Please be sure, people, to like, subscribe. It really helps us to grow the channel and bring in brilliant guests as we've been joined yet again by today. So please, as I say, hit the like button, subscribe, comment, let us know your thoughts below. Anything you want covering on May United, we will try and bring you brilliant fans exactly what you want. So have a brilliant day and be sure to catch me very soon on the MUFC MPB YouTube channel.